you, you may have noticed that, you know, there's a section of the daily office morning prayer uh, that has a, a collect for Sundays, a collect for Fridays, a collect for Saturdays, and then it says collect for renewal of life. It doesn't say a day. It doesn't say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Are you with me? But oral tradition, if you will, this is the sort of stuff they teach you in seminary, is that on page 99, after it says a colic for Fridays, a colic for Saturdays, the next one, which says a colic for the renewal of life, is one that we say on Mondays. Even though it doesn't say Monday in the prayer book. The next one says a colic for peace. That one we, I do. This is my habit, my my practice, I do on Tuesdays. If you flip to page 100, it says a colic for grace. That's the one that I do on Wednesdays. And then it says a colic for guidance. I do that one on Thursdays. So I, I wanted to open us up with a colic for guidance, which I do on Thursdays with you this morning. Um, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life, we may not forget you, but may remember that we are walking ever in your sight. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning in need of particular encouragement, uh, maybe because of something that they are going through, maybe because of the trials of a loved one this morning. We pray especially for them. We pray, Lord, that as we meditate on Paul's letter, second letter to Timothy, Lord, that anyone here in need of encouragement, that that person would be strengthened and encouraged in Christ. Thank you for these ladies. Thank you for these friends. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome again. It's wonderful to be with y'all. Um, I've talked a little bit about why I'm here. The next thing that I thought that I would do as I, as I struggle uh, with a lack of caffeine and open this second bath water bottle, the next thing I thought that I would do is ask, what have you learned in this study? You know, it's interesting that today is our last installment in 1st and 2nd Timothy. Thanks a lot, Father Luke and Bach. I get to close it up and conclude. That's okay. It's going to be fun. But, but what have you learned in this study? Is there anything that sticks out? Anything that uh, in particular made an impression on your heart or mind? Anything that, that you would want to share with me? What have you learned in this study? Um, yeah. It's important to continually remind each other who God is and who we are. You said a lot there um, in that statement, Joyce, but in particular you said remind. It's interesting that that word remember comes up in the call out today. Thank you. What it means to be a Christian is to be continually reminded. Have you ever thought to yourself, why do I have to go to church every Sunday? <laughs> Or why do, we, why do we hear the same collects every year? I mean, that, doesn't that get a little bit boring? No, the, 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 the issue is, is that we forget. We forget continually. It, it's, as if, it's, it's as if part of the human condition is to have amnesia. Have you ever noticed this? I mean, sometimes you can get discouraged and, and then... Something happens the next day, and you're, and you're reminded of something, and you're like, oh yeah, what was I thinking yesterday? The Christian life is about being reminded. It's about remembering, and sometimes I often say it like this, it's about being remembered, re-dash-membered. One of the ways that we, are, that we remember things is by being remembered together with the body of Christ. It's as if we're members of of the body of Christ, and when we drift off in isolation, we forget. We forget the truth about ourselves, the truth about God, the truth about reality. We forget we're suffering with amnesia, and then in order to remember, we have to be re-membered and inserted or reinserted back into the body. Does that make sense? Thank you. Joyce, what else? What else? I wonder if there's anyone else. It could be something that you learned, 
or it could be something that was particularly convicting to you. Yes, Laura? The instructional aspect to Timothy um, struck me very deeply, and, and especially where he says to be instant in and out of season. It's kind of, it, for, for me personally, through discernment, through the spring, through the summer, through COVID, it's kind of the thing that I hung on to as my primary mm -hmm. focus and goal. And, and um, so I think about that a lot, to be instant in season and out of season. In season and out of season. Yeah, it's, it's almost as if Paul wants us to have like a suitcase packed by the front door <laughs> just in case we find out that we have to bolt and, 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 and change, have a major change of plans and be flexible. Sometimes I think of it as a missionary mentality. We're called to uh, be light-footed, not heavy-footed. Always ready to pivot, to shift. That is very good. Yes, especially in a world that's topsy-turvy. Thank you. One more. I wonder if there's anything else. Yes, ma'am. What I'm getting is the combination of both Joyce and Laura. The reminder of something that's told you each time, even though it's told you you're in a different place in your spiritual life, you're hearing something different each time. Amen. Amen. And in Laura's case, the seasonal side, that is, we're seeing different kinds of effects as and where we're hearing the message even more important. Is it the race or is it the, the, the farmer? You know, right. where is it affecting us right. in the season? Where is it affecting us? Because we're always in a different place. Did everyone hear what Lynn said? Um, you know, I won't try to repeat exactly what she said, but um, the gospel always strikes us differently because we're in a different season of our lives. And yes, that is so important and central to what we're talking about. Um, you know, I like to run. I'm, I'm a runner. It's, it's kind of my prayer. It's solitude. Um, and I've noticed that I can be running on the same stretch of trail. And it's the same trail. Like, uh, it's in the same county. It's in, it's in the same park. It's in the same city. It's in the same part of town. But I can run on it in June of 2020, and then I can run on it again in October of 2020, and it seems different. Why? It's not just that the trail has changed, it's that I've changed. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Thank you for those comments. Um, what I want to do today is I want, the first thing that I want to do is to read the passage three times. What we're looking at today is 2 Timothy 4, 9 to 22. 2 Timothy 4, 9 to 22. These are the last few verses, the last couple of paragraphs, if you will, of 2 Timothy. And I, I want to read them together three times. I want to ask three of you to read it out loud, slowly, slowly and loudly. Sometimes I say, that if the only thing we do together is to read scripture, we will have sent the devil running with his tail between his legs. <laughs> so I, I want three volunteers to raise your hand and read. Thank you so much. One, two. And I'll take one more. But before we do that, before we read them out loud slowly, verses 9 to 22, uh, verses 9 to the end of the chapter, before we do that, I want to say just a couple words of preview about this passage. Um, and I, I'll bet that a lot of this will sort of echo some of the things that Father Luckenbach has said already. But this passage in particular, you know, uh, these letters, 1st and 2nd Timothy, they're very practical, right? I mean, it's not as if Paul is what we might call an armchair theologian, um, speculating in metaphysics as he's writing to Timothy. No. These letters are very practical, but I think that these final verses are even more so. More so. This is not abstract doctrine, these last few verses that we're about to read. Um, and they're not even Paul talking to a group. Paul is not speaking to a collective here. He's talking about specifics. He's talking about specifics, and he's talking to a specific. 
He's not talking in generalities, and he's not talking to a general group. He's talking about specific things, even objects, physical objects. And he's talking to a particular person. He's not talking to St. Peter. He's not talking to Apollo. He's talking to Timothy. This is very, very specific and particular. You know, the opposite of general. What, what are some synonyms for the word general? Maybe common? Maybe uh, generic? Uh, but the opposite of that is specific and particular. This is a very particular passage that we're about to read. And it's not just to Timothy as an individual, it's to Timothy as a trusted partner. A trusted partner. One of the things that always gets me about Paul's letters to Timothy is that this is a relationship of trust. And because it's a relationship of trust, Paul is being very vulnerable. It's amazing. You know, um, have you ever heard that phrase, he wears his heart on his sleeve? Have you ever known someone who maybe wears their heart on their sleeve? Uh, it's, it, and this is one of the things that is so interesting about marriage. Um, I would say that my family of origin, we tend to wear our hearts on our sleeves. But then I marry a woman who is from Asia. Wow, I didn't see that coming, God. And believe me, her family of origin, they do not wear their hearts on their sleeve at all. Welcome to the joy of marriage, right? Um, but it's very interesting. I, I'm not going to say that Paul wears his heart on his sleeve whenever he writes these letters, but it's almost like that. He's very vulnerable. He's not hiding behind some shield of safety. He's being vulnerable in these letters. And sometimes I put it like this. Intimacy, because I would say that Paul and Timothy are intimate in this interaction, but intimacy requires vulnerability. Which is a very convicting thing, I think. Think of someone in your life that you long to be vulnerable with. If you're going to be vulnerable in that relationship, it re uh, sorry, think of someone that you want to be intimate with. Intimate with. Maybe a spouse. Maybe a friend. Maybe someone at church. Maybe a child. You, you know that the Lord calls you to be intimate with that person. But think about this. In order to be intimate with that person, there must be vulnerability. It's the way it works. There is no intimacy without vulnerability. Intimacy requires vulnerability. But vulnerability requires trust. There's no way in the world that you're going to open your life up to scrutiny and bear your soul and be vulnerable if you don't trust the person, right? Paul and Timothy trust each other. It's amazing. And it says something about what the body of Christ is called to be. It, when, when, we, when we read this letter between Paul and Timothy, we're not looking at Willowbrook Country Club. I like Willowbrook Country Club, but this is not Willowbrook Country Club. We're not looking here at a publicly traded corporation. I like publicly traded corporations, but you know what? Publicly traded corporations and country clubs, they don't necessarily require vulnerability. Rightly. Rightly. But look at this. We're looking at the church. We're looking at particular relationships, and these are relationships of vulnerability. Intimacy requires vulnerability. Vulnerability requires trust. And then the last point is that trust takes time. You can't just snap your fingers and develop trust with someone. There is no such thing as trust on demand, right? I mean, you might be able to watch the new Mulan movie on Disney Plus on demand, maybe. But there is no such thing as trust on demand. Trust takes time, right? So, intimacy requires vulnerability. Vulnerability requires trust. And trust takes time.
tell you what, I'm going to read the passage first, and then I'm, I'm going to ask Libby and Joyce, did you have your hand up, to read the passage after me. Does that work? This is 2 Timothy 4, 9 to 22. Y'all, I'm sorry that I don't have a handout. I will tell you, um, usually I like to read the ESV for my own personal study. Um, I also look at the Greek and the Hebrew quite a bit. This is not the ESV. This is the NRSV. It's what I have today. I'm going to read this, and then we'll have Libby and Joyce read, okay? This is 2, Corinthians, uh, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 9, through the end of the, of the letter. <clears throat> Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful in my ministry. I have sent Tychius to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Tra Troas, and also the books, and above all, the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will pay him back for his deeds. You also must beware of him, for he is strongly opposed to our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. <clears throat> so I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prissa and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained in Corinth. Trophimus I left till I left in Miletus. Do your best to come before winter. Eubulus sends greetings to you as do Prudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers and sisters. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loves this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful to, my, to me and my ministry. I sent Tychicus to, uh, to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him, because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack, and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in my leaves. Do your best to get here before winter. You must greet to you as do as so do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved the world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you. Because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent 
Titius to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus and Troas, and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him, because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to, to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me great, and gave me strength, so that through the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack, and will bring me safe, safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onimiphorus, Erastus, stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Maltius. Do your best to get here before winter. And Nublius greets you, and so do Prudence, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Very brave souls, Joyce and Libby. Thank you very much. Lots of Greek, pro lots of proper nouns in that passage, right? Uh, does anyone have anything that they would like to say about this? With, with this passage ringing in your ears. We read it three times. Uh, that's a little, a little taste of what uh, pre-modern Christians called Lectio Divina. Just this attempt to let the Word of God soak into your heart and soul. Not to be rushed. Not to read through it quickly. Not to try to analyze it and pick it apart. But just to hear it. That's what Ancient and medieval Christians mean by Lectio Divina, which means divine reading. Lectio means read, like leer in Spanish, or lecture. Uh, divina, divine, divine reading. Um, with those words ringing in your ears, does anyone have any thoughts? Mm -hmm. Anything jump out at you? Yes, ma'am. You know, we think of him as this giant of the Spirit of the Lord all right. But here you see his heart, you see his pain, his loneliness. Bring my cloak. Right. And what Alexander did to hurt him so deeply. Bring my cloak. Yes, that's yeah. isn't it interesting? Yeah. And that he was alone. There was no one in his first defense. I wonder if anyone, no one in his first defense, he was abandoned. Yes, very interesting. There's a lot in there. Um, but yeah, a lot in there. I wonder if anyone, even right now, is missing a sweater. Is there anyone who right now, you left a sweater at your friend's house last night, we have a lost and found with like little kids' jackets in it? I mean, that happens all the time, right? It's very mundane. It, it's a daily detail. You might even say it's boring. And yet that's what Paul's talking about. This is in our holy scriptures. Um, Laura, don't forget your thought. Don't forget your thought. I wonder if anyone remembers their geometry textbook from high school. <laughs> I, wish, I wish that Susan Bracken were in the room who taught math for a number of years. Does anyone remember your geometry textbook from high school? I do. It's very dry. It's very dry. Like, you can read your geometry, and I'm not trying to throw geometry into the math, I love geometry, but you can read your geometry textbook ten times, and are you ever going to learn anything about the author of that book? Sometimes in my, in my, when I teach philosophy to undergraduates at UT Tyler, I will compare the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas with the writings of St. Augustine. Augustine, when he writes the Confessions, he's wearing his heart on his sleeve. Uh, he's sobbing, he's crying, he's laughing, he's talking about his emotions, and, and, and his language is very rich and vivid and colorful, but then you read Thomas Aquinas, and I love Thomas Aquinas, and it's more like a geometry textbook. It's a treatise of propositions and dry thought. Here, as Harriet was just pointing out, here in 2 Timothy, it's more like St. Augustine. It's not like a geometry textbook. It's chock full of emotion 
And like I was saying earlier, vulnerability and intimacy. This is how intimate he is with Timothy. And to think that you and I get a window into that intimate relationship, it's amazing. Why? Well, along the lines of what you've been talking about as far as trust and intimacy, the picture that I have in my mind with this whole chapter is about the fact that Paul is about to die. He is entrusting his legacy to Timothy. I mean, a person that he trusts and loves probably more than anyone on this earth, and that he is preparing Timothy to, he says, you know, go tell Mark to do this, tell so-and-so to do that. Yeah. He, is, he is giving him direction for his legacy after he's gone, and so I, I yeah. Uh, if, if I'm wrong about that, let me know. That's no, kind I don't think you're wrong at all. Yeah. And, and the fact that, that church history tends to think that Timothy was sort of like the first great bishop of the church yeah. um, underlines that point. I think that's totally right. It's as if he's giving Timothy tactics for ministry, but they're not any old tactics. They're like his last words. Yeah, I love it. Um, thank you for those thoughts. Really, really interesting. Um, I want to. What I want to. What I want to do. I want to do two more things for, for the half hour. So I assume that we're supposed to go for an hour. Is that right? <laughs> Good. Um, what I want to do two more things. Um, but the first thing is, I want to. I want to hit the pause button a little bit and just think about how this passage again, once again, it's not sort of like a dry system of deductions, if that makes any sense. But it's kind of messy. It's messy in sort of like daily life, you know what I mean? There's nothing fancy or, or um, whitewashed or even polite about this passage. It's messy. It's messy in, in the same way that ordinary life is, you know? I mean, within the last two hours, as I was trying to re uh, record my intro to philosophy class on Zoom, my two daughters got in a fight, and it had to do with an article of clothing, and it was right outside of my study door, and that was messy, <laughs> right? It was, it, that's the messiness of life. Well, that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing stuff like this. I want to camp out on that a little bit uh, before we dig in a little bit deeper into the passage itself, and there's really two things that I, that I have in mind. One has to do with the nature of this language. And I want to ask it like this. Have you ever heard that phrase, a slip of the tongue? You know, sometimes whenever, whenever you're just sort of letting it all hang out, uh, you can have a slip of the tongue. And I'm not saying that there's a slip of the tongue in Paul's language here, but there's a danger of him having a slip of the tongue. And I wonder if you've ever heard that phrase, or you probably, I don't think you have because it's not very common. But once I heard a speaker say this, that a slip of the tongue can reveal a slip of the heart. That's connected to intimate language, is it not? I mean, part of what's involved here is riskiness. These are not prepared remarks. Paul does not have a teleprompter in front of him as he delivers these words to Timothy. He's letting it all hang out, and it's risky. And you can have a slip of the tongue. Sometimes slips of the tongue reveal slips of the heart. The second thing I wanted to say is actually a quotation from Henry Nouwen. Because, and, and I don't know if you know who Henry Nouwen is, great spiritual writer. I'm sure that we sell some of his books in the bookshop. Uh, Catholic uh, spiritual director who passed away a few years ago. Um, I want to read it to you. Because this is about the messiness and the inconveniences and the details of daily life. Henry Nouwen writes this, While visiting the University of Notre Dame, where I had been a teacher for a few years, I met an older, experienced professor who'd spent most of his life there. While we strolled over the beautiful campus, he said with a certain melancholy in his voice, You know, my whole life, I've been complaining that my work was constantly interrupted. Until I discovered that those interruptions were my work. Can you see how that quotation is sort of 
connected to this passage that we're looking at today? This passage is about the interruptions of life. So-and-so abandoned me. I left my sweater at so-and-so's house. These are the interruptions of life. That's, that's part of it. That's part of our faith. It's part of the life of the church. It's very, very interesting. Um, I thought that my work was constantly interrupted until I discovered that those interruptions were my work. I don't know about you, but that convicts me to no end. <laughs> it convicts me to no end. Convicting. Powerful. Um, Y'all, what I'm going to do for the next few minutes, and this is something that I do when I'm short on time and I find myself, oh my gosh, I have to preach tomorrow, or maybe I have to preach in an hour. This is the kind of thing that I will do sometimes. I will just say to myself, okay, Matt, slow down, take a deep breath, and just sort of identify three words. I, identify three words, maybe three phrases in the passage, and, and think about those. Talk about those. And so that's what I did. And, and this is really what I want to talk about with you guys for the next 20, 25 minutes. Uh, just three little words or phrases. And the first one is in verse 9. At the very beginning of, our, of today's passage, verse 9. And it's the phrase, very simply, very mundanely, very mundanely, it's the phrase, come to me. Timothy, come to me. Very simple, very plain. But I think in a time of pandemic, it's very important. I mean, I look around this room, and with one or two very ornery exceptions, <laughs> y'all are appropriately socially distanced. Do you want to do that? No, you don't. You want to hug each other. I saw people hugging each other in the parking lot as I was walking in from my car. You want to be together. And there's something about bodily presence, embodied presence. I don't even like the word physical. I like the word embodied. By the way, embodiment, embodiment, bodies, is a theological term. It's actually one of St. Paul's favorite words. You know, there's there's a computer, there's Bible software that you can put on your computer, and you can do word searches. If you do a word search in St. Paul's letters, you can you can find out what his favorite words are. And Paul's favorite noun. In fact, his favorite word, if you take out words like the or but or and, <laughs> take out those words, his favorite word. And I'm not kidding you. I can prove this to you. Let's go, let's go get coffee and I'll prove it to you. Body. Body. Think about it. If you think about it, you'll, you'll begin to realize that it's true. Paul, Paul likes to talk about prayer. But he doesn't talk about prayer nearly as much as he talks about bodies. Paul likes to talk about... Mm, obedience. But he doesn't talk about obedience nearly as much as he talks about bodies. Paul likes to talk about faith. But he doesn't talk about faith nearly as much as he talks about bodies. If I had my map with me, I would do a word search right now. And just hear so many times the word body pops up in Paul's letters. It's amazing. There's something about our bodies our bodies, this deeply, deeply important to Paul, to God, and to the Christian life. And our bodies were meant to be together. Thanks be to God for Zoom and YouTube and everything else, FaceTime. And I what, what, what did previous generations do in pandemics? I don't know. Thanks be to God for those things, but they are no substitute for our bodies being together. So who knows? Who knows what the Holy Spirit is up to in this time of pandemic? There's many things, no doubt. I could, I could easily get off track and take a detour and wax eloquent about all the things that, I'm, that I think God is up to in this time of pandemic. I'm not going to do that. But maybe... 
there's something about embodiment and being together and how important that is, not just for the human life, but for the Christian life. Paul looks at Timothy and he says, come to me. If we're separated, even physically, even in our bodies, something's missing. You know, we're about to uh, launch, I think it's okay for me to say this, we're, we're about to launch a Saturday outdoor service at Christ Church South. We're actually going to promote this beginning today. Um, and it'd be real easy for that service not to be a service of Holy Eucharist. It's going to be outdoor, it's for families with kids, bring a blanket, put it out on the amphitheater, bring lawn chairs, socially distanced, no masks, no RSVPs. Uh, and it'd be easy for that not to be a service of Holy Eucharist. We're trying to make it short. So that if a family wants to come in, get there at 5 and be driving away at 5.45, that's an option. If you want to hang out and have a beer and tacos under the pavilion, that's an option too after the service. But we're wanting to make it short and it would be very easy for that not to be a service of but we're making it a service of Holy Eucharist. Why? Because of bodies. Not just Lynn's body, Father Matt's body, Travis Alby's body, Robert Finney's body, but about the body of Christ, Christ's body. When Paul speaks of bodies, he's talking about the body of the literal Jesus Christ. See, I'm talking about his instructions to, t to Timothy. Timothy, come to me. What's that about? That is about bodies. He's saying, Timothy, I can write you a letter, but it's not the same as if we're together, if our bodies are together. So Paul's talking about bodies. And scripturally, whenever we hear about bodies and read about theology of bodies, and by the way, Pope John II wrote Pope John Paul II wrote a, a papal encyclical called The Theology of the Body. But when we read about bodies in Scripture, <clears throat> we read about the body of Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter, the literal dude whose name you could look up in the phone book if there were phone books back then or if there were phone books today. You could look his name up in the phone book and you could find him. He was a literal person. We're talking about the carpenter, the carpenter who ran the lathe over the furniture. He was a carpenter, right? Paul talks about the body of that person, the body of Jesus. But then secondly, he talks about the body of Christ. What is the body of Christ? I'll tell you what the body of Christ is. It is Claudia and Putin's and Linus and all those weird, strange names that we just read. What is the body of Christ? Look to your left. Look to the person on your right. That's the body of Christ. And see, there's a theology of the body of Christ that has to do with the physicality of Jesus of Nazareth. But it also has to do with you and me. This community of which we are members. But then last but not least, there's one more body of Christ. The church fathers talked about the triplex corpus Christi, the threefold body of Christ. It's talking about the body of the carpenter who ran the lathe over the furniture, the literal dude, Jesus of Nazareth. But secondly, about the community. That's the body of Christ too. But thirdly, about that strange thing that we do around the altar. The altar in the service of Holy Eucharist because we say, may this be the body. May, may this be for us the body of your Son, Jesus Christ. And that, too, is the body of Christ. See, nothing can be more important to the Christian life than bodies. The body of the Nazarene, the carpenter. The body of your neighbor and this collective corporate body that we are a part of called the church. And then thirdly, the body of Christ, which is a token of creation. It's a sacrament, but it's physical. And we put it into us, and it becomes part of us. It becomes us. 
So when Paul says to, to Timothy, Timothy, I could write you a letter, we could talk on Zoom, we could FaceTime, <laughs> but that's not the same as if we're together. This is why. It's because we have a theology of the body. And that's the first thing that I wanted to talk about. That's verse 9. Come to me. Okay? Secondly, uh, skip down toward the end of the passage. There, I skipped a lot of stuff. Man, I wanted to talk about uh, so many things. I wanted to talk about so many things, but alas, I only have an hour. I only have 15 more minutes. And so skip down with me to verse 17. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully complain, uh, proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. I want to talk about two more little words uh, as we close today. Both of them are in verse 17, and the first one is message. Mine says message, um, right? So that the message might be fully proclaimed the message. What is this message? What is this message? What is the message? Paul, Paul is, in a very shorthand way, very shorthand, just looking at Timothy and talking about the message, right? This message. We want this message to be proclaimed. Do this, do this, do this. Why? So that the message might be proclaimed. Well, what is this message? It is the good news. By the way, the Greek word there is the word, because I thought it would be the word logos. I, like, you're probably familiar with that word logos. Uh, in John's prologue, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. But what it says in Greek is, in the beginning was the logos. And the logos was with God, and the logos was God. And that word logos is a super important word. It's connected to words like biology. What is biology? It's the logos of bios. It's the logos of life, right? Or anthropology, L-O-G-Y, right? It's the logos, the study of anthropos. Did I say anthropology? Did I say that? <laughs> it's the study of log. Uh, it's the logos of man or humanity, anthropos. Are you with me? So that word logos is super important, and I thought that that's what it was. When Paul looks at Timothy and says, do this, this, and this, because of the message. I thought that the Greek word was logos. It's not. It's the word kerygma. Let me hear you say kerygma. Very good, all of you Greek scholars. <laughs> kerygma means preaching. Apostolic preaching. But you see, Paul is talking about this message, this preaching, the core of the good news, like Lynn said, the core of the gospel. But what is this core? Now, it's very interesting. I used to be in a more evangelical type denomination, uh, and we would have arguments about the gospel. What do you think the gospel is? Oh, no, 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 that can't be it. What do you think the gospel is? No, you're wrong in here, let me tell you why. I'm thankful that we don't do that in the Episcopal Church. I'm really grateful that we don't do that. Um, but we do want to stay tethered to the Scripture, and in particular the apostolic word, the testimony of the apostles. And so what is this message? What is the core of the gospel? Well, I can think of no better place to look than Romans 3, sorry, Romans 1, Romans 1, 3 to 4. And I'm going to read it. And I think that this makes sense also because who wrote second who wrote the letter of second Timothy who wrote that? Paul. Paul. Who wrote Romans? Paul. Paul. Really good reason to look at Romans, right? If you want to know what is Paul talking about, let's look at something else that Paul wrote. This is Romans 1, 3 to 4. What is the gospel? You know, theologians might argue about it. Uh but Paul has a very concise description in Romans chapter 1. He says this, The gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness, by resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. What is the gospel? Here's a good thing to keep in mind. Paul says this. I'm repeating it. I'm reading it again. 
the gospel according to the I'm uh, sorry, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. And I think that there's at least three parts to that. One, it's interesting that Paul talks about David. Right? King David, the person with whom we associate the Psalms. King David, the paradigmatic king of Israel. King David, who I think that we're invited to regard as kind of like the proto-Messiah. There is the Messiah, the great hope, the great expectation of the Old Testament, yes. But if you want to know what the Messiah is going to look like, look at David. David's kind of like the proto-Messiah, the preliminary version of the Messiah. So Paul talks about David. Why? He's making a point about Israel. There's something about the gospel that has to do with Israel. Okay? Paul didn't invent a new God. A new deity. No, he's talking about the God of Israel. The God of Israel, the Lord, L, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Yahweh. Right? That is the God who he's talking about, and he's invoking that God by referencing Israel. So there's something about Israel that's important to this gospel. Easy for us to forget, living in the 21st century, by the way, my... My ancestors came from uh, Scotland and England. I'm pretty sure that there's not a drop of Jewish blood in me. I'm thoroughly Gentile, although I have had people say to me, Matt, you look Jewish. I'm like, thanks, but no thanks. I don't know. <laughs> but it's easy for us to forget that our faith is tethered to Israel. And, and really, I think you can say Paul was not a Christian, because there was no such thing as Christians back then. Paul was a Jewish man who followed Jesus the Messiah. So there's something about the gospel that's tethered to Israel. But secondly, Paul talks, Paul says, I, I, I'm not going to flip back. Paul says that Jesus is truly human and truly divine. This should remind us of the creed that we say every Sunday. The person, this Jesus, this Jesus person who came from David, he's truly human and he's truly divine. That's important to the gospel because if he's not a, tr a human like us, he's not connected to us. But if he's not God, he can't save us. He's got to be both truly human and truly divine. And Paul includes that in the gospel. And then the last thing that Paul's obsessed with is the death and resurrection of Christ. The, the death and the resurrection. It's interesting, he doesn't talk, the word death doesn't pop up in this summary of the gospel from Romans 1. He doesn't mention the word death, but he talks about resurrection. Can you have resurrection without death? I don't think so. I don't think so. So, so Paul is talking about the message. He's looking at Timothy saying, Timothy, make sure to do this, 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 and this. Why? Because of the message. So the message can go out. That word for message is, is kerygma. That means preaching. And what is the core of it? Israel. True God and true man. Death and resurrection. That's how Paul thinks of the gospel right here. Okay? That was from verse 17, this word message. I'm going to read verse 17 one more time. Uh, just when I get revved up, it's time to quit. <laughs> uh, it happens every time. Yes. But not when I preach, you people. You've got to admit, I preach pretty short sermons. <laughs> At least sometimes. At least most of the time. All right. Verse 17. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the message, kerygma, might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. The last word I want to talk to you is this word, hear. Um, it, it just, it popped out at me and it's in the passage so I get to talk about it. Um, it's very interesting, y'all. I'm a philosopher. Actually, today 
is the first day that I can actually say I'm fully, fully done, done, done with my PhD. You know why? It's because the hard copies of my dissertation arrived at my university today in Ireland. So, and, and they confirmed it, and I had to work all this out through the thesis center in Dublin. Had to send, this is the second time I've done it. I've done it twice. I did it for my defense, and now I'm doing it fully and finally. I had to send the PDF to the thesis center in Dublin and they have to print it out and deliver it. And because of coronavirus, the university's closed most of the time, so it had to get there today, and it's it. So thank you to God for that. But um, I, I'm a philosopher, and so I think a lot about the Greeks, the Greeks, people like Plato and Aristotle. And for the Greeks, guess what the primary sense was? How many senses do human beings have? Five, what are they? Someone over here, what are the five senses of human beings? Give me one. Sight, what else? Hearing, what else? Taste, touch. Is there one more? Smell. Now, a lot of people in the ancient world and the modern world, they say, let's think about taste and smell. They kind of reduce down to touch. If you think about it, taste and smell are touch. No, don't, I, I can't defend that, I can't prove that to you right now, but a lot of people said that in the ancient world, and I think people even today say that. When you taste, first off, when you smell something, you're actually tasting it. And when you taste something, you're actually touching it, because it's like on your taste buds in your tongue. It's, it's, it's different from hearing or seeing, okay? So there's touch, hearing, and seeing. Touching, hearing, seeing. For the Greeks, Plato, Aristotle. The most important one is seeing. Seeing. That's why I, I could go on and on about this, but I'll just give you one little example. There's, there's this thing called the beatific vision, which is, is this notion about the end of the Christian life, maybe it's in heaven, where we finally get to see God. And, it, and it's a, an amazing truth, and I could talk about it for a long time. But the point is that that's about seeing. For the Greeks, for the Greek mind, and this is true for people who write in Latin as well, the prominent sense is vision. But for the Jews, it's not seeing, it's hearing. When they went to church, when they went to the temple, they didn't have a printed Bible that they were holding. The printing press had not been existed yet, had not been invented yet. They didn't read the Word of God, they heard it. See, and the liturgy is something that, not, that we don't primarily read. The liturgy is something we hear. And for the Jews, hearing is the prominent sense. That's why Paul says, I think it's Paul, I think it's Paul, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You see, the Word of God wasn't something primarily that they read, it's something that they heard. Now, real quick, for Christians, so I talked about the primary sins for Greeks, the primary sins for Hebrews, Jewish people, what about Christians? For Christians, it's touch. It's back to everything we said about bodies, right? Touch, that's why we eat in the Eucharist. We smell the chalice of wine as it comes to us at the altar rail. All of that is about touch. The incarnation is about touch because the word became flesh. A little baby that we can hold, a little baby that we can touch. So for Greeks, it's seeing. For the Hebrews, it's hearing. For Christians, it's touch. But what's interesting is that in this context, Paul is not channeling the spirit of Christianity He's channeling the spirit of Judaism because he's talking about hearing. This message is something that is heard. It has to be proclaimed. Why does it have to be proclaimed? Why can't surely you can send an email, Paul? No, it has to be proclaimed. Why? Because faith does not come by reading. Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the Y'all, thanks for having me. I think I'm out of time. Does anyone have any 
questions, comments, jokes, riddles. I've got at least one yes ma'am Lynn. Loudly so that all your friends can hear you. Okay, one, the other thing that stuck in my mind yes. on 16 and 17. Yes. At my defense, no one, and I circled no one, came mm. to my support. And then he says, but the Lord stood by me. The Lord stood by me. So he was never alone. He's and never alone. the thing that he's sharing with Timothy. Wow. When you're alone, you're not. When you're alone, you're not. I love that. Easier said than done. But, you know, my mom passed away 18 months ago, and I spent an, an average of... 50 minutes, six and a half days a week on average, talking to my dad. I talk to my dad every day. And and I say to him, Dad, Mom is with you. That's not some Hallmark greeting card sentimental stuff. No, that's biblical theological truth. Rosemary is in Christ. Dawn is in Christ. And Christ is in Bo. Christ is in Nancy. And therefore, Bo is in Nancy. Uh, sorry. Rosemary is in Bo. And Don is in Nancy. We're never alone, even when we're alone. Why? Because of the Lord. Because of the Lord. Amen. Anything else? Jokes, riddles? <laughs> going once? Going twice? I'm going to close with the Collect of the Day. You know why? Because I'm thinking about preaching on it this Sunday. The Collect of the Day for this coming Sunday. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more that we either desire or deserve, pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace. Great to be with y'all this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.